dressed. First shooting success, Crowman Doyle and Thor. No, not exactly a Marvel comic strip. Striker Jack Pike pose as we enjoy a day at Paul Childerley's shoot. I'm a lover and I'm a farmer. Stop. Stop, shall we? Pimp my hide. I meet the guys behind the one-stop woody shop. Bargain Hunter. The people at Shooting Sports UK have created a thermal unit kit deal just for you. Plus, Gutter Press. Channel 4 News breaks further reporting guidelines covering a shooting and conservation story. We're on to them. We have news. We have hunting YouTube. This is Field Sports Britain. I can leave it on if you want it on. It's entirely up to you. If you want the jacket on. The lengths people will go to for a day's shooting. No, not Andy strutting his stuff for the new Jack Pike catalogue. We're talking about the hand sanitizer and social distancing rules that shoots are adhering to all across the country to make sure we can all keep shooting. My mum made it. Have a look, your mum made that. Mum made that. <laughs> Good, isn't it? Does the job nicely. Is that from your like curtains when you were little? <laughs> or your duvet? Yes. Or is that your comfort blanket? I'll be eight. <laughs> Ah, cool as a cucumber. Ice cold. Right, right. Okay, we'll grab your kit, load up, and we'll head to the first drive. The team of guns may be smaller than normal, but COVID-19 is not going to spoil our day, especially as we have the 2020 winner of the Jack Pike competition joining us. Blethyn Thomas has come from West Wales to spend a day with the likes of Crow, Doyle, and Thor. Andy is fresh from a sim day with me. This is a bit like when you're in a police station and they ask you a question you say, no comment. It's, it's that sort of time. You think okay, really? To tell the truth, I was really surprised. He shot really well. Um, he got to the last stand and it was a bit out of his league. Uh, but no, it was good fun. It was a good, good crack. Well, I shouldn't really be saying that. I, I think it was more fun than you, David. <laughs> A Jack Pike day, but Andy's put on his lucky blazer Y fronts. Hey, I've got a thong as well. Oh, no. Yeah, <laughs> I've got a blazer, pair of speedos for when I go swimming. Beat that. We haven't been ages since we've been in the pool together. Oh, no, that was good, wasn't it? Hey, <laughs> first we went in the sauna. Hey. Oh. Everything hanging down and swinging, dragging on the floor. Hey, oh. There's plenty of shooting for all the guns, and Andy makes his mark. On the next drive, we catch up with Dan Thorpe. Dan came to the attention of Jack Pike and other shooting brands thanks to his positive posts and creative imagery on Instagram. But he has a confession to make. You do take some some lovely shots. Do they take a lot of setting up? Or um, you I'm going to have to hold my hands up there, but the missus does most of that, to be honest. Like probably 80% of the pictures. You're joking? No, I'll probably do 10%. I'm not good with the camera. So you've got, I was waiting. I was going to say, right, OK. So Dan Thor is going to give us advice on how to take Instagram shots. But I've let you down. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely ain't down to me. But you enjoy it? it yeah, yeah, no, I really do enjoy it. Like I said, I've, I've met you guys doing what we do today, and without, without Instagram, I wouldn't have the opportunity, really. Yeah. So it's been really, really good. But yeah. shooting, how big a part of your life is shooting? Are you... Um, Dad's been an underkeeper for years now. I got involved when I was about four years old. Used to follow the main keeper around on my little quad bikes. Oh, my goodness. And that's the old keeper, John. Obviously, the old man's filming it. So where are you? Just coming in the pen now, look, I'm just in front of him, there we go. Started shooting when I was seven, had a little 16 ball, I can't remember the make now, but that was my first ever gun. Uh, started on the rabbits and gradually moved up to the pigeons, and then I think my first game day when I was about sort of 14, 15. Yeah. So yeah, like I said, I've been involved from a very early age, and yeah, I really appreciate everything I do, to be honest. 
With the bag building, it is time for snacks and bubbles. Talking of bubbles, Jason has a trick of the trade to share to ensure fast and efficient loading. Well, the pockets are a little bit deep if you're doing a lot of quick loading, especially if you're double gunning, because I would I'd have it on that shoulder. If you're double gunning, so you open the gun, have the gun open like that, and you're just trying to grab these, and you're not looking at them, so you just want them sitting up as high as you can. So these pockets were just a little bit deep, so just jammed a bit of bubble wrap in every one, just so the cartridges sit a bit higher. Not just a pretty face. Well, that was actually a, a lot of loaders in the West Country do the same. Um, it was a trick Gerwin Jones taught me. I think he uses toilet roll though, which is a bit oh, well. very third world. <laughs> <laughs> Very Welsh. Easy. <laughs> Sheep, sheep's wool or something. Easy, easy. All right. Uh, <laughs> so you've gone for the more clinical version. Just it was. You'd be stuffed if you got caught short. It was, yeah, it was just what I had at home. Um, yeah, so and it's sort of waterproof as well. So. Is Carly expecting a busy drive? I don't know. Are you? <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> yeah, on a day like this, we'd usually just be loading from the pocket. But no, it's sort of smart as well. This is a great catcher bag. This holds a slab of shells um, between the, the front and the main pocket. It's great for when you're pigeon shooting because you can empty a slab into that and it's a handy way of carrying it. Yeah. Tell me about the colour. Oh, what? Chose the colour. It's a wonderful like colour. He, he was so excited yeah. when he got the purple. Nobody's going to steal it. Beautiful. Well done. Well done. Shot more on this drive than anybody else I've filmed today, so. <laughs> <laughs> Curse of the camera doesn't affect you. No. At lunch, we have a chance to speak to our competition winner. I think it's been a day I'd hoped to be, and more to be honest. Uh, but, you know, it's been a cracking day, really, really good day. From the minute I've set foot here, it's been welcoming. Everybody's had a, had a, a joke and a laugh, and the camaraderie and the banter, is, it's, it's been really good. And the, and the birds that we've, that we've had over us today have been really, really good birds as well. Cool, have you done much shooting this year? Uh, this year, no, I haven't done any to be honest, apart from the one, one flight on the local pond we have. Um, but I haven't done any driven, driven shooting this year, so it's the first day for me this year. So what about reaction from friends knowing that you're going to be here today? Yeah, they were quite, um, I, don't, I don't know what the word is, but uh, annoyed that they hadn't <laughs> entered it themselves, I think. Yeah, definitely. Paul saves the best drive until last, and Andy reveals some new bombs. Oh, that's it. Oh. Right, then. They're going to go well? They're going to go well. At 11's, he's had a bit of a load up on sweets for me and you, David. Okay. Yeah. Salty caramel. The salty ca they are the business. Salty caramel, they're the kiddies. These are all right. That one's yours, that they one's yours. My favorite, these ones? Yeah. Yeah, they so were. For Christmas, I'm going to get one of those These, these are the dogs. Mm. Dogs. Mm. What's it? Okay. Yeah. Save them for after the it's always a good day, it's a good laugh. First game shoot this year with the social distancing on, always a bit, how's it going to work? But it's worked really well. Paul's really stuck to it all. There's where you go, there's uh, sanitizer in and out, the guns bust, but. Hard work though for them, isn't it? It yeah, is, they've it's. They've really pull the tops out this year. They really have, it's. I mean, with the whole year, really. I mean, well, it's, how it's, many birds you order? That's right. Am I going to sell the day? Am I going to do this? And, and then all the, like Paul's had to go out and buy himself another gun. But, uh, to keep people separate, but obviously we've got Leffen who's, who's won the, the day today. He's yeah. going back into, into Welsh it, Wales. That's and, right. Uh, so I imagine shooting's going to be stopping in Welsh Wales. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah then, but as of I think it's Friday. Where they choose? I think it's as of Friday. I think they're, that's, they're shutting shop again. Um, but yeah, I think it's going to be a long old winter. Uh, we're only just starting now, so I think it's going to be a long old winter. Hey ho! I'm glad I'm a farmer and not a lover. On that as well. Um, <laughs> I'm a lover, not a farmer. Yeah. I'm a farmer, not a lover. David, it's a, Sorry. a fighter, not a lover. I'm neither. I'm not, I don't fight. I'm a lover and I'm a farmer. Stop. Stop, shall we? Stop. 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 <laughs> For more information about Jack Pike gear, go to jackpike.co.uk. Thank you, chaps. Always a good day at Paul's. Now, from snappy dresses to a man.
about to snap. It's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. Lockdown measures in Wales will cost shoots millions. The Welsh Government's attempts to stop coronavirus spreading in hotspots such as Cardiff and Merthyr Tydfil includes the countryside and at a crucial time of the year for shoots. The measures will be in place from Friday the 23rd of October to Monday the 9th of November 2020, forcing the cancellation of all shoots, including some of the most desirable in the UK. Then there's the knock-on loss to local hotels and estates. Few of the shoots are insured. Will Horner from Cambrian Birds, which runs the Sweet Lamb Shoot, among others, is worried what this will do to the Welsh countryside. The reality is that um, we manage the estates to benefit game, but as a result of that, we also benefit the wilder wildlife, um, which we have a vested interest in doing. Um, and if the money's not coming in to manage the wildlife and the grounds to do so, then naturally there's going to be a knock-on effect um, and, and the wildlife in the long run will suffer. 2020 has been the worst ever for dog thefts. A report by the BBC quotes staff from lost dog organisations blaming the coronavirus lockdown, saying the demand has increased, raising prices to record levels and prompting criminals to take advantage. This film shows thieves attempting to steal dogs from Paul Childerley's keeper's backyard. The Kennel Club reported a 168% rise year on year in people looking to buy puppies on its website during lockdown. Many of the stolen dogs are female and used for breeding, and several of the dogs recovered were in pup. Boxing Day hunts are still happening. Last week it was suggested they might be cancelled, however they're moving out of town. Meets will now be held in rural locations away from towns and village centres. Despite the move, the Countryside Alliance says some have been scrapped and there won't be social meetings after the hunts either. A BBC documentary has been removed from the broadcaster's iPlayer video on demand service after farmers complained it was biased. Meat, a threat to our planet, focused on perceived damage to the environment caused by meat production. Presented by Liz Bonin, it was supposed to give viewers a partial analysis of the impact of livestock farming based on intensive farming methods. The BBC admits the programme is not impartial. The National Farmers Union points out most beef on sale in the UK comes from British farms using less intensive methods and that Bonin did not include different opinions. Staying with our impartial national broadcaster and BBC Countryfile presenter Ellie Harrison says the countryside is racist. This comes just months after the programme was slammed for a feature accusing rural communities of racism. Writing in the BBC Country Farm magazine, Harrison defends the story, insisting white people need to wrap their heads around history. She says rural areas need to stamp out prejudice. But Harrison admits that, compared to urban UK, the countryside is maybe, maybe not, more racist. Harrison's comments, which appear to have been influenced by the Black Lives Matter political movement, comes just weeks after the BBC's new Director General, Tim Davey, told employees not to be political. A landowner in Wiltshire was left extremely distressed after a hunt sab allegedly punched her in the face. Police have released photos of the suspect, who wrongly believed a fox hunt was in progress on the victim's land. The landowner told police she found the woman and a friend trespassing on her private farmland, and that one of the intruders punched her after she asked them to leave. The incident happened near Chippenham. Anyone with information should call Wiltshire Police. The Animal Liberation Front has claimed responsibility for an attack on a butcher's shop in Norwich. The front of Hazel's butchers and two of the shop's vans were graffitied and their locks and letterbox glued. Animal abusers, we are coming for you, was the message the culprits posted on the unoffensive animal website, which was forced to move its server to Iceland earlier this year after police shut it down. According to local media, another Norwich shop called Fiddy's Butchers had its windows smashed and was spray painted. The German Hunting Association is pushing back against hate crime and online cyberbullying against hunters. It supported more than 50 court cases against antis. Spearheaded by internet crime specialist Dr Heiko Granzin, haters have had to pay out more than 10,000 euros in damages. Swearing at a hunter on Facebook cost Joachim W 3,800 euros in fines and costs. 
Evelyn S paid 3,300 euros for calling a hunter a bitch. Angela H paid 2,000 euros for threatening to shoot a hunter in the rear end. And Eurilo had to pay out 1,400 euros for calling this woman an ugly woman. President of the DJV Hunting Association, Dr. Volker Boyning, says criminals have to learn that the internet is not a legal vacuum. Thanks to Jens Merker for the story. The state of South Australia has introduced licensing laws for a toy gun. The police say gel blasters that fire small pellets that need to be soaked in water for a few hours before use aren't dangerous, but they look dangerous, so owners need licenses. The move has been ridiculed online, but the cops claim it's hard to tell real guns from fake ones and put this picture quiz out to try to prove it. The correct answer is D. The force says that the variety of responses proves their point, although they didn't say how many people got the answer wrong. Owners who don't want to get a firearms license for their toy guns must hand them in to police stations before the 7th of April, 2021. American anti-hunting groups want to sue the US Fish and Wildlife Service for not protecting giraffes in Africa. The groups, including the Humane Society International, petitioned for giraffe protections in April 2017, but the species still hasn't been listed under the Endangered Species Act even though the animals are not native to the USA. The group says the US government is ignoring the giraffe's tragic plight, which it's blamed on habitat loss, conflict poaching, and of course, trophy hunting. They do not acknowledge the contribution hunting makes to giraffe conservation. Thanks to Pell Holmseth for that story. A report on the state of nature in Europe says habitats are either in poor or bad condition. The partial report blames hunting alongside illegal killing as one of the main threats to birds. It ignores the effect that 75 million domestic cats have on bird and small animal populations. Among bright spots, say the report, are the rewilding projects, including the revival of wolves in Germany and Belgium. And finally, a hunter in Sweden has had a close encounter with a moose he was hunting. It's the first time Arka Lundström had taken his young daughter out with him. She keeps her cool while filming as the moose charges. Luckily, Arka manages to dispatch it at the last moment. He's visibly shaken by the experience. You are now up to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Thank you, David. And there is more news on our website. Now, we have discovered that the big hearted sorts of shooting sports UK in Staffordshire are also the biggest dealers of HIC thermal products in the UK. And they've come up with big savings just for Field Sports Channel viewers. The 6mm 35mk monocular usually sells for £499. You can have it for £426.55. The 15mm monocular at 899 is available to you for 85405. The 35mm monocular is £1,749 and our deal price is nearly £100 off at £1,661.55. The Pro 35mk version of the 35mm monocular usually retails at just short of £2,700 and it is yours for more than £100 off £2,564.05p. Simply visit their website, there's a link in the description below and input FSC deal at checkout and fill your thermal boots. The code is live now and will run until the 30th of November 2020. Now we've always wanted to produce a series called Pimp My Hide, where Andy goes all Lawrence Llewellyn Bowen and makes over your decoys, nets and other shooting efforts. But is that really Andy? And these next guys have jumped the gun with their own terribly house and garden mobile pigeon hide. If you're a pigeon and you see this heading across a field towards your flight line, be afraid. It may look like an ordinary trailer, but look what happens when they open it up. It's a masterpiece of comfort, design and eBay shopping. I talked to its proud builders and owners, Jamie and Chris, who show me round it at Jamie's home in Buckinghamshire. And this is what it started like. Um, I gave us a year to, to put it together, but um, it took about, what, five months? Four less, months? Less than four that, months? three or four months. Three or four months. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, OK, so, Jamie, what, which bits are you particularly proud of? The roof, because we never thought it was going to 
work because uh, it weighs quite a bit. And, and, and um, I welded it. <laughs> and he welded it, yeah. We wanted it to work on gas struts and we were worried that because of the weight of it, that it wouldn't work. So the roof is what we're proud of the most, I think. And uh, well, in the internal as well. Who was lead designer? You, I would say I was, yes. <laughs> and were, you, were you lead welder? Yeah, I was Yeah, trying to make most things. And... Well, we actually got the netting from off uh, social media. We found it in Coventry and it was a uh, from a sports hall. They did a play and um, it was 10 bin bags full, which is what we needed. We nearly used all, all of it as well. Wow. Gas struts found, just found online. Again, it was a bit of guesswork and how much we had to lift. Uh, we actually, they're adjustable gas struts, so we actually had to take air out of them, which was quite surprising. And Chris, yeah. just talk me through the things I can see in the background. Is that a basin? Yes, we have a sink for, um, well, we sink cooker and a chopping board. So we breast all the birds. And then obviously if it's cold, we can have nice cups of tea and hot soup and then wash your hands at the end of the day. That's amazing. Seems an idea. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and a cool box underneath cool box for, the, for the breasts. Ah, wonderful. Uh, storage yeah. cupboards either side. Yeah, drinks covers. And then under these bench seats, we have decoys, whirlies, flappers. These bench seats look like they've come from somewhere. A 110? 110 Land yeah, Rover. Yeah. Yes, okay. Yeah. Was Another it? find on the internet. The stools look good. Where do they come from? They're just general workshop stools. Yeah. Um, found them cheaply online again. Uh, took the wheels off and just bolted them down to the floor. Yeah, and a bit of engineering class rehab oil strain has gone on on top. That's it, <laughs> yeah. of course. <laughs> Very good. Matching bins. I mean, it's beautiful. Yeah, it's yeah. ideal. It, it seems to work all right. We thought it might be a bit big. Yeah. But it blends in really well against the hedge, doesn't it? Have you shot anything in it yet? Yes, we have. We went out for our first day a few weeks back and got on really well. We were lucky. We were in the right place at the right time, I think. But yeah, it was brilliant. It was warm. Yeah, and we finished on 150 for the day. They came in perfectly. Ones, twos, all day. Yeah. yeah it was just a perfect first outing. Do you have to find a, a high hedge to park in front of it? Does it, it must need, because it's a, quite a shape, isn't it? Yeah, well, we, we were under a high hedge. Um, and yeah, we can obviously shoot out of one, one way, but it would be good to, well, try and put it anywhere really. Against a hedge, I think we needed, but I think it will work well anywhere. And you're going to capture a lot of people's imaginations, Jamie. How much did it all cost in the end, to be honest? It totaled about £2,000. And is that what you told your wife, or is that how much it really cost? <laughs> Lucky I'm single, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> What a great creation. If you have an unusual hide or stand, please send me a photo or a video by email charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv and we may be able to put together a feature on them. Thank you, Jamie and Chris. And as I mentioned, please tell us about your ingenious hide makeovers. Now, Channel 4 News has recently adopted an anti-shooting agenda. We've already made two complaints to Ofcom about them. News editor Ben O'Rourke caught up with the latest victim of their discriminatory reporting. If at the end of the day you want a vibrant countryside with vibrant amount of habitat and, and, and species living in it, it is our method which is, which is clearly the most successful. Where all the vulnerable species are, are protected and where the vulnerable species uh, nest. It seems with the rest of the country where the shooting method is not put in to the conservation, that they're, they're, they're struggling. Jimmy Shuttlewood has been a gamekeeper for more than 30 years. Since he was a child, he's been taught good traditions and techniques passed down through generations that keep the countryside alive. So he wasn't prepared for a Channel 4 news reporter who knows little about moor management to question his knowledge in a story which claimed that muir burn or heather burning is bad for the environment. After Jimmy proves to Jane Dodge that peat stays damp and undamaged after the heather above it is burned, she suggests his experience of muir burn can't be trusted because of a criminal conviction 13 years ago for allowing his underkeepers to use illegal traps. At the height of the raptor persecution scandal in the early 2000s, police caught Jimmy's underkeepers using cage traps baited with live doves. Everybody's entitled to freedom of speech, so um, obviously if anyone can ask me whatever ever, 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 ever they want to ask me. But I'm I'm very confident in the view that what we're doing is very right. 
some great big issues are being made about the way that the, uh, the country people are looking after the countryside, whether you're a farmer, whether you're shooting. Uh, in fact, there's not many professions now which are truly, where well, you're truly a man of the earth. You know, where, you, where you're truly in connection with the ground and the surroundings and the woods and so on. So there's very, very, very few um, professions. So we get challenged. The hypocrisy in Jane Dodge's dodgy reporting, which includes getting Jimmy's name wrong, is that Channel 4 News trusts claims made by animal rights extremist Luke Steele over Jimmy. In an anti-shooting report two weeks earlier, a Channel 4 News reporter doorstepped a grouse shoot in an attempt to get shoot staff to incriminate themselves over trapping birds of prey. Steele has four convictions, including intimidation of persons, and has spent 182 days in prison. That's 182 more than Jimmy. Instead of trying to discredit Steele, Channel 4 chief correspondent Alex Thompson may have committed contempt of court by declaring in his report that a local gamekeeper is guilty of killing a goshawk before a trial had even begun. Thompson bases his assertions on this video provided by Steele from possibly illegally placed trail cams. Strict liability contempt is supposed to prevent the media from publishing sensationalist material about a criminal case until the trial is over and the jury has given its verdict. Thompson and Channel 4 News appear to break those rules with their report, which can still be seen on YouTube. Anything can be twisted with a little bit of film cut, a little bit of someone saying something. I didn't see anything getting killed in that film. What I can see was that something was put in a bag and, and perhaps taken away. But the rest of it is, 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 all, is all assumption. Is Channel 4 taking part in another crime of hate speech against a minority? It seems to be uh, an open season on gamekeepers and country people. It seems that you can say what you want, you can offend, you can be prejudiced, you can bully, you can, you, you can say whatever you want, and, and that's perfectly all right. Well, I cannot say how that is acceptable if other, if other minorities were treated in the same way and viewed upon that we are, there would be hell to pay. I mean, if the RSPB and other, other charities keep saying that gamekeepers are persecuting birds of prey, well then everybody's going to believe that every gamekeeper kills, kills birds of prey. The RSPB says it wants Heather Burning banned and is leading a high-profile campaign that involves politicians and activists. So it seems odd that at the same time it's advertising a job in the Cairngorms that involves Muirburn and deer culling. The consequences of not controlling the heather with burning had a devastating effect on the moor decades ago. This particular part of the moor that we're on um, caught fire in the 1950s. It burned over 2,000 acres and it was in a, in a time of year when it was uh, dry and hot and windy and it, it took several, several weeks to get under control. Bulldozers were brought in to bulldoze the peat down to the bedrock because it was a peat now that, that was a light and we lost three feet of peat. The sheep had to be taken off the moor, there was no more sheep in the area, there was no grouse, no grouse shooting and the ash was knee deep. Now as we're driving along we're seeing these bits of stones and these are the remnants of a, of a Bronze Age village which, which came, which, which was unveiled by the peat being destroyed by the fire. The lessons we learned in the 1950s on this ground was not to let the heather get long. It took 20 years until you could put any sheep back out on the hill, until the grouse started to appear and they all followed the growth of the heather. So the heather had to regenerate from ground zero, literally. If we banned heather burning, what do we, what do we have? The first thing, the first thing is, is summer fires these wildfires. And guess what? These have happened on the RSPB reserves. The RSPB have not managed to conserve their peat. They've, they haven't managed their mower. They've, they've left the heather long, which means this, is, this, is, this, this, this makes the peat extremely vulnerable. The RSPB's annual report also claims heather burning causes flooding, which Jimmy dismisses with basic physics and biology. What I've noticed in my experience, what causes flooding is an awful lot of rain. And when we see the, where we see these floods are, where we see these floods are, there's been 
four, five, six inches of rain falling. The heather doesn't actually absorb water, so whether it's there or it's not, the water still falls off the heather pretty immediately onto the peat. It's been raining today, um, and the peat does absorb a certain amount of water, but it doesn't absorb it quickly. So we've got a puddle here that's just, just been formed. This, is, this isn't formed for any reason, then the dry heath is compacted and doesn't particularly soak up water like, like blanket bog does. So the idea of, of, of peat soaking up water, it does slowly, but when you get a lot of rain quickly, it sim simply bounces off and runs, runs downhill. Revive, a group that promotes rewilding, claims grouse moors can become wooded wonderlands teeming with wildlife. It ignores the huge conservation benefits that grouse moors already provide and the fire risks of acre after windblown acre of scrub woodland. Uh, I, th I think the actual operation of planting trees, you would have to plough up the peat, you would have to disturb the peat, you would release the carbon dioxide from that. And you would have no more heather and you'd lose the habitat from those species which have evolved over the, the 7,000 years, which I'm told is the history, which, 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 which is the natural history of this area. There'd be no longer any, any, any sustainable population of, of red grouse, there'd be no nesting for curlews, no, no habitat for the golden plover, and no habitat for the, for, for the lapwing. So our country, United Kingdom, would be less diverse without our unique moorland that we have it. There's nowhere quite in the world that has the moorland like we have it here. Jimmy is concerned about the future but for a different reason, the lack of skilled people to carry on his centuries-old trade. If it is very difficult employing people that you don't have to train from scratch. So I was trained by my elders, some, some are dead now, quite a lot are dead now, um, and I'm always learning different things all the time. We've got to adapt. Everything's an effort. Everything is a huge effort. So the, the, the children that are reared here uh, see a nice, shiny, uh, easy, easy way of living out, outside world and, and quite often get pulled out. And then the people that have had the easy living, which have seen the romantic side of living in the countryside, come and try it. And some actually are quite natural and, and take to it really well. And that's the we need space for those people. I think that sign's probably from the 50s and 60s. Um, people were more in touch with the countryside, more in touch with what can go wrong. Just uh, kind of makes me think what people have forgotten from the lessons we've learned in the past. Thank you to Ben and Jimmy, catchy name for an ice cream. And now it shall be, from Cookie Day to the wider world of hunting and shooting on YouTube, it is Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. Donald, Trump and Obama are bolting rabbits in this film. Mr Johnson's working terriers channel is out with two ferrets named after American presidents. Tommy from Rural Pest Control Whitwell sends me his latest YouTube video, his first ferreting day of the season, and he is out with his dog Bramble. On Facebook, Gwyn Jones posts a windy day decoying pinks from last season with Bruno and Martin decoying on a large grass field with hide built into a blackthorn hedge. Viewer Adam is a fan of Khan Adams's hunts in New Zealand South Island. Here he is out with friends in a Canterbury Valley looking for tar. Staying in New Zealand, Lewis Huntfish heads into his ballot block on the Otago region. He's after a couple of deer for the table. He doesn't film the shots, but it's a good story. And South Island rifle walkers are also out in the Antarctic weather. They are in the Southern Alps looking for a mature tar bull. This is the hunting adventure. I haven't featured Don Mealy for a while, one of my favourite US hunting channels. In this film he's on a morning white-tailed doe bow hunt, what he calls the mock scrape and rub tree. And finally, a short sharp film about walking up Partridge in Morocco with the locals next. It's on the Simo Chass Pro channel and it's a stark reminder for walking guns to stay in line. That's it for this week. I've put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the eye symbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you would like us to pop into the weekly top eight, email me the link charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. Before we go, welcome to new members of the Field Sports Nation, Rob Sharp and the surprisingly named Yip Yip Ding Ding who joined us on YouTube and to Terry Jackson who joins us on Facebook. They're helping us fund our news reporting, which we reckon is vital with the antis doing their worst. 
And if you'd like to join them, please go to fchannel slash fieldsportsnation. While you're there, don't forget to whiz over to the rest of our website where you can like us on Facebook and on Instagram. You can follow us on Twitter, subscribe to us on YouTube, and of course, pop your email address into our constant contact box on our register page, and we'll contact you about this show, Field Sports Britain. It's at 7 p.m. UK time every Wednesday. And this has been Field Sports Britain. Good hunting, good shooting, good fishing, and goodbye. <laughs>